Okay. All right, folks. Thank you, thank you very much for showing up here. Um, first bit of housekeeping I want to do here is um, I see several of you have already eaten. You've had your lunches, right? So what happens after lunch is a lot of times people start to nod off. Okay, I can't have that as a speaker. So what I want you to do is I want you to look left. I want you to look right. If you see that person nod off, you got to elbow them. Okay. If, if I catch somebody nodding off, I'm going to break out in some dance moves, and nobody wants that. Here. Okay. So keep that in mind. All right, and we'll stay on. It. I do have an absolute ton of stuff to cover here. I want this to be interactive. I want questions. I can zoom through some stuff if we need to towards the end. Um, whatever it takes. I'm also happy to talk to anyone afterwards, too. We're going to talk a lot about like social engineering, phishing, and ransomware here. I'm going to talk a, a little bit about that as well. So let's get started here. We'll get through the preliminaries. I work for Novi4. Um, we're an organization out of uh, Clearwater here. We do a simulated phishing uh, and a security awareness training platform. Okay. Why this matters is uh, one of the free tools that we have is called the Fish Alert button. People can click that when they get a simulator or a phishing email, and it, they can CC us with it. So we see about 12 to 1,500 emails per day that come in that some poor stuffer has to look at, right? What happens is we see the new ones that are happening, the new strains that are going on, and we try to work that into our platform to keep people from getting you know, hit by it. But um, a guy named uh, Kevin Mitnick is involved in our company. He's a partner. Some of you may have heard of him. There's one or two people that have kind of heard of him. He's not even he's not been out for a while. Man. Uh, he's, he's got his own uh, red team company now, so he's, he's loving that. He's like, he's awesome. I get paid to do this stuff now. So, uh, and like I said, we're over here in Clearwater. Me, uh, CISSP, I was a security manager for the second regional cyber center Western Hemisphere, which is a terrible thing to have when you're in the Army because that is not something you can acronym. So we had to answer the phone like that, right? <laughs> that really stung. I was also the uh, Director of Member Relations and Services for ISC Squared. How many CISSPs and stuff do we have in here? Awesome, I need all your votes. I'm going to be running for the board this year talking to you after. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> self <-based> plug. <laughs> money. <laughs> uh, but I worked for them for a couple of years. Um, and I, I've just been in IT and stuff since mid-90s. I've been manufacturing, healthcare. Uh, obviously, DOD, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So that's my background on this stuff. I love seeing the new stuff that's going out. I'm not a salesperson. Yay. Uh, why am I here talking about this? Well, we're seeing these headlines over and over again. Lots of headlines on ransomware. We've already heard about it a few times this morning, right? Um, so it's a big deal for us. Ransomware is usually spread through some sort of social engineering. There's some off-sites uh, where you know, it comes in in other ways, but typically it's spread through some sort of social engineering. So I'm going to talk about the different kinds of social engineering here. I think I'm going to focus a lot on the ransomware side because that seems to be where a lot of the interest is. Uh, we'll talk about all of it. So we got your in-person stuff, you got your social media stuff, you got the stuff I call remote, which is your phishing, your vishing, your smishing, um, and then, of course, the pathetic stuff. Like, I'm a Nigerian prince, and I'm out of money while traveling in Nigeria, and can you cash my third-party Nigerian check? Okay. We're not really going to talk about those much because we all get those, and they're kind of old school. They still happen on occasion. If you ever go to, uh, let's say, Walmart and go to their little Western Union counter there, there are signs that say, don't send money to somebody. It's a scam, period. Stop. Okay. Because that does still happen, but for us, it's not really a big So starting here... Uh, the in-person stuff, right? So you got your tailgating, you got your physical security stuff, the in-person people. Now, I often say you can get very far with a hard hat and a clipboard um, or confidence in a clipboard because people tend to, uh, you know, react. They, they don't want to get in those situations where you have to challenge somebody, right? And this is kind of a, a cool little deal here. Uh, I thought this was pretty funny. Um, from the show White Collar, he's trying to get into this thing, right? So he shows up, he's like, you know, I, I ran out of hand, he's got all this stuff. Uh, my card's in my back pocket, <laughs> if you want to grab that, right? And the guy's like, uh, yeah, don't worry about that, you know? Nobody's going to stick their hand in your back pocket. Make it awkward on you, make it weird for them, and odds are you're going to get to go wherever it is you need to go. Or if you look like you really belong, people don't like to challenge folks. So... This is a really good way to get into things and do stuff, right? This is a social engineering piece. And all social engineering comes down to 
dealing with the human factor and the things that we want to avoid, the things that we don't like, um, the things that make us feel uncomfortable, whether that's urgency in an email or a phone call or something like that, that is what it all boils down to social engineering wise, okay? So there's also the social media side of things here, all right? We see it all the time, and I mean just about every news site we ever go to now, even the big ones down at the bottom, you have all of these little clickbait things, right? Um, you won't believe what they caught the cashier doing. Watch closely, and you know. The one that kills me is this one. Five things you need to know about clickbait. Number four will blow your mind, right? <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for you know making an example out of that. But this is going on out there. This is definitely out there. This is hitting people, people are doing it. Most of it is to get you to go and, and you know add revenues and things like that. <coughs> um, there are some social media ones that are out there that try to get you to go to sites or to like something on Facebook, which increases the value of that particular um, account. And then that account is sold to somebody who now that you're friends or you like them or you had an interaction, they can now hit you with a bunch of their stream. These are why these things are for sale on the dark web sometimes. This is what they do with these sorts of accounts, right? Um, this, is a, this is an interesting one right here that's been going around lately. Um, so this one preys on the, some of us, definitely not me, have done really stupid things on camera, perhaps when we're in a tequila fuel evening out. Um, I, I've heard this happens, okay? But basically, this is one of those sorts of things where they're hitting people up on Facebook through a messenger and they're saying, hey man, check out this video, I can't believe you did that, or something along those lines. And they're getting people to click on these links, right? And these links obviously lead to, oftentimes it's a credential fish, ooh, you need to log in to view the video of you doing something stupid. Um, or they'll, they'll pop up something like a codec download or something, you need to watch this, or in order to watch this video, you need to have this codec, you need to have whatever it is, okay, you see that a lot. People are falling for it, right? Um, especially just the, the millennial folks that aren't necessarily uh, aware of all the things that are going on, and they're very at home in things like Snapchat and Facebook and stuff like that. So they're getting stuff spread this way too, malware, etc., etc. right? Now this is where we really get into the meat of stuff. This is where it gets fun. Phishing, obviously, that's going to be your email types, right? There's spear phishing, there's whaling, there's your regular phishing, which is just kind of sending out a bunch of stuff in the spam with a malicious link. There's also phishing, voice phishing. Has anyone here been hit with the voice phishing thing or heard of it? Right, yeah, you, you know, you get the, the tech support scams. Um, you also get the IRS ones um, where, yeah, you get the messages or something and they're going, hey, you know, you owe a bunch of money. Um, pay us or we're going to come arrest you. Because the IRS is known for warning you before they kick your door in, right? They said you had to warn for your physical address and social security number. Yeah. That doesn't make sense. Yeah, but you know what? It scares people. People that don't know get scared when they, when they get these kind of messages. Call back right? the call center. Yeah. Yeah, you call back to a call center somewhere in, in India or Eastern Europe, you know? Uh, good times there. So that's the, the voice phishing, the phishing. The other one that's taken off right now is smishing, SMS phishing. And a lot of times what we're seeing in that is the SMS phishing will be paired with either a voice or a, a traditional phishing attack. So what will happen is these guys are getting good. They'll send a, a spear phishing email or a whaling email, and they'll follow up with a text message that also says, I sent you an email, I need you to look at this really quick. Or do whatever with it, right? The idea being to reinforce the fact that they sent that email, take your guard down, because that's what they want. They want to get your guard down, they want you to click on things. So we're seeing this sort of thing actually happening in one, two punches. Um, or you'll end up with a voicemail that says, hey, you know, I need you to look at this, or you know, something along those lines. Um, a lot of times with robocalls, they'll say, we've sent you an email, we need you to check it, this is your bank, so on and so forth. It just validates it, right? And it makes it real for people. So the smishing, how many of you guys have gotten something in your SMS that's like, hey, this is your bank, I need you to log in and look at whatever your account or your funds are low or something like that, right? I see some hands here. You got one right now? Yeah. Valentine's Health and Wellness. 
Health and wellness. That's a sign for your heart. Know your numbers. Yeah, so we're seeing a lot, a lot of that sort of stuff going on. Credential fishes or even malware. Even on the phones now, they're getting where there's more and more like Android malware that's happening. And this is, this. it's free. It's easy to spoof somebody's uh, phone, honestly, online uh, and or uh, SMS. So. Uh, Moving into phishing, why is phishing such a big deal? Well, 91% of data breaches started with a spear phishing attack. And the reason that's happening is we built wonderful, great, hard perimeters. These are tough things to get into, right? It takes a lot of effort to get into these things. You've got to have zero data, you've got to have whatever. It's very difficult. Where sending emails and getting to somebody that's inside the network already and already has access to these sorts of things that's what they're focusing on. The return on investment on this is so much higher than spending time on a hardened perimeter. Um, people do dumb things, and they're you know they're working that. So these breaches, a lot of the things that go along with these phishing emails, you have CEO fraud, which is also known as business email compromised by the FBI. $3.4 billion lost in the last couple of years. That's billion with a B. Getting emails that say, hey, I'm your CEO. You need to wire a bunch of money to so on, uh, to somebody. Uh, a lot of times it'll be, you know, I'm doing a, uh, uh, an aggressive takeover of a company. I need you to send this money. I'm in negotiations right now, so I can't get on a call. Do it now. It's got to be hush-hush, though, too. And people are falling for this. Uh, there's a cousin, which is the W-2s. So the W-2 scams is very close to the same thing. And I saw this myself in a company I was at in Palm Harbor. Uh, we get an email, our HR gal gets an email from the president of the company, who was out traveling at the time, said, hey, we, uh, we need uh, your, your W-2s, or I need the W-2s. I'm about to get on a plane. I'm going to be working on them when I'm in the air. When I land, i got to send them to our tax guy. I need them now. And she said, something isn't right about this. Now, the email is beautiful. It had a signature block, fonts, picture, everything was perfect, right? And we think they got it out of his out of office response, which was, you know, uh, pretty good. Now, she realized that something wasn't right, and I've always had an open door policy on that. She came to me, and of course, we looked at the headers and showed her what was going on with that. But this is happening a lot. This is very successful, and it's happening right now. I was going to say, it just happened in Manzi County, the school district. Yep. It's about 7,700 W2s that the payroll clerks have right. to. So I've talked to a number of FBI folks, um, special agents out there, and they say within two to three days of this happening, a lot of those people will have their taxes filed. And that's a nightmare when that happens to you. You have to get special numbers and all kinds of stuff in order to file your taxes in the future. It takes a long time to get that back. But we're seeing it right now because this is tax season. So for all of y'all, if you guys don't have a policy already in your organization, first of all, you need to let your, your leadership know that this is happening. You need to tell them that uh, to set a policy where you do not send money or anything that's very important, significant PII or records or anything like that, without actually getting on a phone and hearing their voice. No way you're going to do it with an email. It's a simple thing but it'll make a huge difference in how this happens. Uh, talked to a gal at uh, one of the meetings. She, uh, she got hit by the CEO fraud stuff. And it was CFO sent the money, picked up the phone, then called the CEO and said, hey, boss, I did what you want. And the boss went, what? That's a bad thing. That's a bad feeling. Um, they were able to stop it immediately, like get on the phone with the bank and stop it immediately. And you can do that sometimes within 72 hours, right? But it still took them eight days to get that money transferred back. Now imagine you're a company and that's your payroll. You know, you get the fish that says, hey, we have a new payroll account that you need to send this to. Here's the number, wire it off. You've now sent your entire payroll to that. What does that do to you as a company, right? And it's as simple as picking up the phone first before you do a major transaction like that or transfer PII. Okay, this isn't really high-tech stuff. That's the beauty of this. Um, and then, of course, ransomware. You know, uh, huge money in ransomware right now. So, example phishing emails. I want to show you kind of the things that we're seeing. Um, it's interesting because in some of these cases, we can almost 
guess what kind of ransomware is in it. This one here, um, has my order been shipped? You know, Whiskey Tango Foxtrot, what's going on with my stuff? All right. Um, this is this is pretty common. My guess is I can almost guarantee you that's server because they tend to uh, focus on the business, uh, the business side. All right, and this is going to be one that goes along with that. Where is my order? And people are going to click on that. They're going to go, oh my gosh, this is this is bad. This goes back to social engineering. This is messing with your emotions and causing a sense of urgency. Right? <laughs> That's almost definitely server right there. But you know they throw in all this stuff down here to make it look legit too. This isn't the Nigerian prince scams. They're past the bad spellings. They're past the bad grammar in most cases. There's dark websites, uh, dark web sites, where they offer services to go through and fix your grammar, fix your spelling, and they guarantee a 5% increase in click rate by doing that. Okay? You're getting smarter. Uh, this is another one, USAA. Okay? Um, this is a very nicely done email. Um, but when you start looking at it, there's a couple of things that stand out. Here, you notice the font and the spacing of the font's a little bit off. Um, I can't imagine they would let it go out with a lowercase SAA. Um, and there's a couple of things that you can look at here. You know, USA.A, and then, you know, your account number to start. Your average person doesn't know to look at these things, right? But it doesn't take that much to teach them to look at these things. Once you've seen it, you kind of go, oh, yeah, that's easy, right? It's not that hard. But this is a real email that we had come in um, that's kind of showing you what that looks like. And this is another one that gets a lot of people. This was going around around Christmas time. Everybody's ordering everything. They're trying to get stuff in. You know, nobody waits for stuff on Christmas to order gifts, right? Um, so this was hitting a lot of people. It was this. It was order delayed. Um, some of these were credential fishes, or they would say, hey, we need you to re-enter your credit card information. All right? But again, some of the tells are the same here. You've got, uh, well, first of all, the font changes. It says, by replying to this message, the billing name, and then down here it says, please don't reply to this message. But people don't read that part, right? <laughs> it's, it's right there for you to see, okay? And then, of course, if you hover, it goes to wherever that is. Uh, that's, uh, I don't know, I can't read it on the screen either. But it's not Amazon, and I'm pretty sure Amazon can afford to have their own hosted server, right? Um, but this was getting a lot of people. This is one of the hardest ones we built the template from. It's like five stars in our difficulty rating because people just can't wait to click on this. Right? <laughs> they see something that comes into, some of these have ridiculous things that they've ordered, like fuzzy unicorn slippers. People are like, I never ordered that. You know, they just can't wait to get in there and click on this. <laughs> Personally, I like fuzzy unicorn slippers, but we'll let that go. Um, oh, moving on. Uh, big money here. So this is that CEO fraud I was talking about. $100 million lost, they got $74 million back. Um, that's big money. That's not something small, OK? Um, it's not typical, but uh, you know, it definitely happens. This is one. This was Leone AG. It's a multinational company or a global company. They do wiring harnesses for vehicles pretty heavily, right? It's one of these companies you've never heard of, but it's huge. This was an interesting one because the scammers got into the system through a phishing email. And they actually cruised around for a while. This was like an APT attack. They read the documents. They found out they read the documentation on how to send these, uh, these wire transfers, what the process is to have that happen, who had the access to the biggest amount of money. And when they hit, they hit hard, they got 40 million euros, which was about $44 million U.S. Boom, gone. They didn't get the money back. Okay. This stuff is getting very advanced. Now, the fact is, a lot of these are only ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000, but that may be enough to cripple an SMB or really hurt an SMB. Not everything has to be in this, and we don't get the reports of all of these big money ones because, quite frankly, your business can be hurt by acknowledging breach. So they'd rather eat that than potentially lose 20% of revenue going forward over a breach like this, okay? So the W-2, we talked about this. This is Argyle uh, School District. This just happened. Uh, so they're having to contact all of the current and past employees of the district because 
Somebody just sent all that money or all that information out. And the thing about the W-2s is if you lose the W-2s, there's no getting it back like some of the money. It's out there. It's done. And they're acting on it quickly. You can't get that back like you can some of the money. Um, and then <laughs> Snapchat. It happened to Snapchat last year, too. Some people may have heard of Snapchat, right? Um, they kept this pretty down low. I got to give their PR folks uh, credit on this. It, it didn't uh, didn't go real far, but Snapchat did it to all of their employees. Fired out the W two. So now this year they're having to have special codes and special processes to file their taxes because once your social is out there, it's out there and it's done. Okay, you're not getting it back. It doesn't change like credit cards do, right? This is why credit cards are so cheap on the dark web as opposed to the things it takes to steal your identity, all right? Uh, big difference in value there, uh, medical records, because all of that stuff doesn't change ever, or credit card numbers change like that. So then what can you do? Well, you know, first of all, see if your domain is susceptible to spoofing, okay? And honestly, we can run a test. It's free. We have a bunch of free stuff we do for people. We can run a test on that and see if your domain is susceptible to spoofing. If it is, Implement SPF records, um, DKIM and DMARC are a couple of the te technologies that work with that. The idea being, if it's not an authorized uh, email server for your domain, it should flag it, it should tell you, it should do something, okay? Because if you're getting emails in from your CEO that's not coming in from your email server, there's likely to be something wrong with that, okay? This is not difficult. If you host your own little websites, um, cPanel actually has a way to set up SPF records. It's in cPanel, for God's sakes. People need to start doing this. We did a, a check, and about 83% of the email servers that we checked allowed spoofing. And it's not hard to fix, OK? Um, the other thing is, like I said, review your procedures for funds transfers. Talk to people. Make sure your leadership's involved, and they're aware of the issue. And you tell them straight up, I'm not ever going to transfer money unless I talk to you on the phone. Um, and let them know again. It's it's going on out there, and they're targets. So we'll talk about ransomware now. This is some fun stuff here, right? This gives you an idea of how ransomware started. And little known fact, way back in the day, there was actually a strain of ransomware that evolved on floppies. It would infect the machine. I actually remember hearing about this. It was way back. I'm old as hell. Uh, but you would actually have to send money to a box, I want to say it was in like uh, the Caribbean somewhere, and they would send you back in a decryption key, right? But it really took off here. 20, 2013, into 2013, CryptoLocker, everybody's heard of CryptoLocker, right? This is where they started leveraging Bitcoin. They started leveraging some of these things that are anonymous or semi-anonymous types of payments and or communications, right? So you can see here 2013, and it just exploded. This was the first quarter of 2016. This is the major variance that happened first quarter of 2016. That's how much it's exploded. And it's exploded because it's high profit and very low risk. These guys aren't risking anything, and it's just making them money, right? So some of the new ones, they talked about it this morning, popcorn time. This is a nice one. This is how they're getting creative, right? So. If you get infected and you infect two more people and they pay, you get your decryption key, right? Sharing is caring. <laughs> um, now, I think Eric talked about it this morning at the keynote. What he didn't mention is they do have to pay also, right? So if you just infect a bunch of people and they don't pay, well, you've just made a lot of enemies um, and not got a lot out of it. But I want you to look around the room and pick out two people that you don't like. <laughs> that you would do this to, because this is really what they're trying to get. What's your email? No. What's your email? What's your email? <laughs> yeah, right. There's a lot of finger pointing going on, right? Um, I haven't seen this a lot in the wild. I've heard of it a couple times, but it hasn't really spread huge, okay? Um, the next one, this is a nice jigsaw. So um, this was someone's misguided attempt at... Uh, teaching people things. So in this one, they infect all your files, and then they have you go and read two articles on how not to get infected by ransomware. Okay, brilliant, right? So this was you, you were dumb, now read this, and we will give you your files back. And they will. 
you get the decryption key for reading these two articles. And it's not clickbait articles, it's not anything like that. But here's the catch. If you don't go read those articles, it does wipe your files. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, thanks for trying to teach me these things. It really sucks that this machine is not on the internet now. I don't know. It's just like, okay, thanks, guys. Appreciate that. So, that's a nice jigsaw, aka, or also known as a Kuluva. Okay, it's not very high quality code. Um, there's been, I, I have heard and seen this in the wild a little bit, but it's not like huge. Okay. <laughs> Um, this one here, this is Goldeneye, too. Uh, these guys are not very nice to tell you. So Goldeneye, basically, you get your infection with Goldeneye. And I can get you the slides, too, if you don't want to wear yourself out with the phone. It's no problem. I can get you on the slide there. Right? Uh, but Goldeneye infects the files, right? So you get infected. It infects your files on the box. Then it forces a reboot, right? On the reboot, it comes back up. Looks like check this is doing something. Well, check this is not doing anything. What it's actually doing is it's now encrypting your master file. Okay. Sorry, camera guy. I'm driving you crazy. I know it. I told you I'm a walker. I warned you. Uh, so it's going to infect your master file table, and then it's going to pop up the you've been infected, your hard disk are infected, pay the ransom. Now, if you pay this ransom, you get your machine back, it boots up, it boots in, and now it says your files are also encrypted. Pay up again. Okay, so this has the potential to hit you twice for the same thing. Now, this would make me very upset, okay? Um, I believe there's a possibility that they can use the same decryption code for both of them, but it's really up to the people that send out the malware whether or not they want to do that. But this would really stink to get your box back and then find out that, hey, we got a problem again, right? Um, sort of similar to, you heard a little bit about um, uh, the issues that were going on with MongoDB and some of that was happening, right? So MongoDB databases, um, unsecured out on the networks, uh, on the interwebs. And in some cases, these boxes had been encrypted multiple times, or the really smart guys just go in there and change the files where the Bitcoin wallet goes to. <laughs> and they're actually having money sent to them, and they didn't even do the infection. Awesome stuff, right? But <laughs> these guys, there's no honor among these thieves, let me tell you. Um, Spora. Now, this is going to kind of counter what I just said, all right? Because Spora, first of all, has this beautiful UI, right? There are a lot of coders that could learn a thing or ten from building a UI like this. We've all worked on garbage UIs before. I'm like, this is this is beautiful. Man. So, what's different about Spora? There's a number of things, and I'm really impressed by this string. First of all, um, what it does is it offers you different options for your restoration, right? One of the really cool ones here is, I don't know if you can see it, it's called immunity. Immunity from future infection. So what does this tell me? This tells me that this is related to a ransomware as a service deal, okay? Where folks, they don't even have to be very smart, they just have to have a list of uh, email addresses and something they want to do. They hire these um, services that run the whole infrastructure. And then it's usually a pay-to-play sort of thing. Like, you know, if you infect 100 people, then we keep 70%, if you do over 100, we do 30%. There's this whole sliding scale that goes on with that. In this case, the immunity, I believe, will keep you basically blacklisted off of their future attacks, okay? Very cool, right? Yeah. Only 20 bucks, it can be yours, no, 50 bucks, it can be yours, right? Now, this Spora will actually change the ransom amount based on the files that it's encrypted, so it's not always the same amount, right? Um, the other thing it does is, you have a chat box over here. <laughs> greetings to all. Once you feel real good when you're infected by this and get a greetings to all message, right? That just pissed me off, too. <laughs> uh, and it, this is something that we haven't seen a lot of. It's spreading like a worm. So, you get infected with this. Any USB drives that are plugged in, etc., etc., are hit by this. Your desktop. What it does is it takes these files, it applies a hidden attribute to them, right? So by default, your users probably don't show hidden files, right? So those things essentially disappear, but it also creates an LNK file or a shortcut to that file. So it's right there, it actually looks like it's right there. The trick is the LNK file also launches malware when you click. So you double click that file, it's actually a shortcut. It will open that folder, the user doesn't know any better, and it kicks off ran uh, ransomware, malware, whatever it is, 
and pulls down more stuff. This happened to, uh, I'm almost positive it was Spora that, this, that did this. There was a, uh, uh, in California there was a nursing school, and one of the instructors was working on the slides at home or whatever, and, and ended up not being able to work on it. Couldn't open his files, right? So he said, well, I'm going to go into work and see what happens. So sure enough, takes his USB drive, goes into work, plugs it in. Next thing you know, this nursing school is hit with this uh, ransomware. Locked down a whole bunch of stuff there. Um, that's how it's starting to spread also. So the initial vector is usually an email. But then think about it. Hey, it doesn't work here. Think about it from an instructor or a user's mindset. Something's wrong with my machine. I'll go see if it works at work. Sure enough, right? So this one is, is it, it's actually very advanced. Um, and we're seeing more and more of this out there right now, too. And here's some of the attacks. Some of these are funny. Some of them aren't. Uh, this is Osiris, variant of Locky. Locky's still the number one ransomware out there. Hit this police department. Um, lost eight years of evidence. Okay. So most of these these people had already been you know convicted. There's a couple of them out there floating, and they said, well, we have the paper for a lot of these too. So somebody's going to be rescanning all of this stuff, right? But eight years of evidence lost. All right. And this is what gets me on this one. The automatic backup started after the infection, so it just backed up infected files. Now, folks, does this sound like a backup to you or some sort of a replication, right? So they were not doing things well there. Lost eight years. That's pretty significant. Uh, another one here. I don't know how many of you have heard of this. Two-thirds of the police cameras in D.C. were down due to ransomware from the 12th to 15th of January. That's five days before the inauguration. Somebody developed an ulcer during this time. I can <laughs> promise you that. All right, five days before this politically charged uh, event is going on and their cameras are down, they found two different strains of ransomware on the different CCTV cameras. But yeah, wiped right out 123 of 187 cameras. It's pretty scary, guys. Who knows what was going on during that time, right? That's a huge chunk. Then another one. Oh, yeah, this is great. Um, Libby. County, Ohio. I don't name them, folks. Uh, <laughs> so ransomware hit the county there, took down a lot of the 911 stuff. Um, Landlines were down, a lot of the computers were down, um, thousands of machines were down. So they were logging contacts to 911 manually. Uh, and I love this quote by the county auditor. Apparently our clock still works. <laughs> that gives you any idea of, of how bad things were when the county auditor is saying, well, at least the clock still works. Okay? Um, that's pretty sad, uh, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Think about this picture for a second. All right. um, those are outhouses. <laughs> Somebody's about to have a crappy day, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, so for those who rely on endpoint protection, don't. Okay, endpoint protection. There's arguments that endpoint protection is dead. You, you can make that argument, I guess. I don't believe it is. Um, I think uh, it saved my bacon before, just as a last ditch. Right. This is all about risk reduction at different levels. All right. This is called a rat quadrant. Have any of you seen a rat quadrant? Oh, jeez, man. Virus Bulletin, they do this. Um, they rate these antivirus programs or endpoint protection programs. Uh, first of all, they check them with a bunch of new strains with all of the reputation stuff and the ability to download signatures available right then. And that's this up here. So the best ones are actually about 96% effective, but the bulk of them were about 90%, meaning 1 in 10 malware strains got right through. Bang. Okay. Now, you take the reputation stuff out. That's this one right here. You take all the reputation, you take all of the updates, they take them offline for 10 days, and then throw three new pieces at them to check the heuristics, right? Best of breed here is like 78% that caught it if something's not going on. This is how, how much they're relying on this stuff right now and how quickly it changes, okay? It's better than that. Okay, but it, it can definitely save your, uh, save your baby. This is one of my favorite... Um, cartoons here, right? Um, the future of ransomware. This is ransomware IoT, right? 
it's funny because this was done before the DNS attack, and you had these ones here. Excuse us while we participate in the DDoS attack. This guy is a visionary. All right. Uh, but my favorite one on here is actually this one here. Send me 25 bucks, or I'll tell everyone on your social network you were stupid enough to buy an internet connected for a <laughs> That's brilliant. I love it. So users are clicking on these things as fast as we can get them to. If we were able to have users be as efficient with their work emails as they are with phishing emails, man, we could change the world. All right? But these guys are writing these very enticing emails to get people to open these things. You saw some of them, the Amazon stuff. You know, your, your pink bunny slippers didn't ship. Who's not going to click on that quickly, right? Within an hour, 55% of people typically are clicking on these links. <laughs> This is, a, this is from our ransomware uh, survey that we did. We did one in 2016, we did one in 2014. The key things to note on here is it's almost exactly the same down here. The top two things to fight against ransomware is have good backups and teach your people not to do stupid things. Okay. Now, a lot of folks here are probably thinking, you know, I've done security awareness training. I've fallen asleep during security awareness training. <laughs> I've hated security awareness training, all right? I got news for you. Um, most of us technical people and us security people, we kind of stink at putting together meaningful security awareness training for your users. Okay, we're all excited about really nerdy stuff, and they're not. Okay, uh, just like if, can you imagine if, uh, let's say, a county put together awareness training, what it would do to us? Right, we want to throw ourselves out the window. Okay, and this is why traditional awareness training has actually not been very good. It's done for compliance. Uh, it's done because PCI says we have to, or NIST 853 sections say we have to, or now NIST uh, 800 which is kind of a spin-off of that. Section 3.2 says you have to do awareness training, right? So what do we do? We check the box, right? But if you think about what's going on, they're attacking the users, again, that are behind those hardened firewalls, behind the perimeters, behind all of those areas, and I will not use the castle moat thing uh, that so many people do to, to try to spell this out. But uh, the biggest things we can do here is train your users. Weapons grade backups. Now, when I say weapons grade backups, what I mean is don't just a assume that your backups work because they don't. Okay. Um, don't don't just let them run and not check them. Okay. Three, two, one rule. Three copies of the data, two kinds of media, one of them off-site. It can be a little flexible on the two types of media. If you're doing a cloud-based backup or something to disk, it's off-site also, right? The idea is you don't have stuff that's around where it can be encrypted by the actual malware, because that's happened a few times. Uh, there was a police department in Texas that got hit and said, ah, oh, we're not paying, ha, ha, ha. No, they did because their backups were also infected. That's a bad thing. You also want to make sure that you can restore your data without wiping all of the forensic data on the stuff that's been ransomed. You won't think about that. Do I have enough space to actually restore my file server after all these files are done? Because when your insurance guy comes in and you're making a cyber insurance claim and they go, all right, let's see what happened, you go, oh, I wiped it all. They're not going to be happy, all right? They're probably not going to deny your claim, but they're not going to be happy that you've now wiped all of this forensics data, right? So you need to have space to do that. The other thing is, Make sure you can restore critical boxes as a BMR. Make sure you can do a bare metal restore on boxes, okay? It's great that your SQL database is backed up every two and a half seconds, okay? That's wonderful. What happens if that box goes down? Well, first of all, if you get hit with ransomware or something on that box, you're not going to want to trust it, right? You don't just put the data back and call it good. You need to wipe that box. Do it for more. It's the only way to be sure, right? That means, how long does it take you to restore that box? Okay, so I'm going to restore server 2010. I'm going to install SQL. I'm going to go through and I'm going to run all the patches and stupid little things I have to do and changes in order to get the SQL box to come back up. That could take you a day or two, and you're not even talking data yet, right? So think these things through when it comes down to what you're doing with your backups and test them. Every once in a while, go pull a handful of files off there. Make sure it's backing up everything you think is backing up. All right, um, enclave or segment your network. Don't let the receptionist be able to get to a login screen on your SQL servers. <laughs> All right, it, this is simple stuff, folks, but 
I took over a network not too long ago, and sure enough, you know, I'm told that, oh, everything's got VLANs, everything's all nice and neat. Well, all the VLANs routed every other VLAN, so what the hell's the point? <laughs> um, when they told me they had a DMZ, the DMZ was there's a firewall here, and then there's a couple of boxes back here, and everything can talk to everything. Don't let that happen, because the stuff is spreading across the networks, right? Limit that. This is security 101. This isn't like high-end stuff, but we've concentrated so much on technical things anymore and all the whiz bang cool stuff that the marketers get us to spend money on, we're leaving the door open on some of the simple stuff. Okay, we have to think about that. Uh, principle of least privilege. Again, if they don't need access to it, don't give them access to it. Not everyone needs to be an admin. Therefore, if they're infected with a piece of malware, they can't go out and get all these other things, right? Uh, keep an eye on your, your network, monitor it, look for things. Have a sim, see what's going on, correlate things, get alerts, right? That's important. And patches. Now, we've gotten a lot better at OS patches. We still kind of stink at app patches. We really suck at browser updates. Okay, but these are some of the things that are being leveraged to get this malware in the system. Work on that. I know it's not easy, but we want to work on that. And you need the defense in depth. You know, I'm talking about. Perimeter network, you gotta have it. You gotta have your IPS, you gotta have those sorts of things, your firewall out there. Your internal network, you want IDSs to look at things. If stuff is going out and it's going to known bad spots that are command and control networks or something like that, you need to be aware of that, right? So you need your IDS. You need your host based stuff, file integrity monitor, register integrity monitoring, etc. etc. App patching and keep an eye on some of the data, right? Um, canary files. Stuff like that is good to have. Um, see if things are hitting that. Um, I mean, told I'm low on my uh, time. So, what we found, and you can do this on your own, you're not that well product to do it, but if you do these four things, you can make a big difference. Check your users, start fishing them, train them, and fish them. Okay? Start off with the baseline. You gotta know where you are before you can move on, right? It's the whole measure manage thing. All right. Uh, you want to train your users. You want to give them good training. Training they're going to pay attention to. Don't stuff them in a room, feed them coffee and donuts, and expect them to learn anything. Okay. Use something preferably self-paced, something interactive, where they actually have to like do something other than stare at a screen and boom on the desk. All right. Uh, and then you fish them. This is huge. The two things there, the training and the fishing, make the biggest difference. You train them. You let them know we're going to follow up and we're going to try to fish you. You don't want to give them a bad idea like I'm out to get you, but we're trying to make you safe. We're trying to do good things so you don't do a lot of shame when you catch them. Very important. Um, it's all about trying to get them on board with this sort of thing. But you're telling them when they're in the training, you pay attention to this because it's coming. And every month you're going to get hit at least once or twice by this, and we're going to see how much you retain. And then finally, you keep an eye on the results. All right. If you are doing these phishing campaigns and you're getting down to like one or or 0% click rates, you need to make it tougher. And that's where it gets really fun. That's where you get to get really creative on some of these things and get people to click on stuff, right? Uh, it's, a, it's a challenge. This can be a ton of fun. It really can. So I've kind of covered this. Uh, this is what I look like when I watch it most of the time. Um, and this this one reminds me of that dude in the insurance commercials. Like, gotta be quicker than that! You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's only one of people, though, right? Yeah. Um, I'm right? keeping that picture forever, just because of that. Um, and you know, this is the whole measuring managing. I'm trying to go pretty quick through this stuff. Um, the other thing you do is randomize emails to people. Don't send everybody the same email at the same time. Because they're going to pop up and they're going to go, Bob, I got suckered. Don't click on that. All right. You want to test the people's ability to look at an email and go, something's not right here. Not their ability to yell over a cue ball. So it's very important that you test them like that. Um, and then personalize it. Um, in our platform, it's kind of nice to be able to um, hold the placeholders there where you're taking their information, you're saying, hey, Bob, you can even do a manager's name. Hey, Bob, Phil said you need to send me this file. Let me see what happens. Or Phil sent me this, wants you to look at this, because Phil is their boss, and it fills these sorts of things in. This is where you can get really, really creative with this stuff. Um, and you want to keep them up to date with the latest stuff, right? When the iPhone 7 came out, uh, we saw almost immediately emails that were like 50% off regardless of your carrier. Click here. That stuff happens when, when something like that goes on. When somebody dies, somebody important dies, like after Prince died. It was crazy. 
all of the emails that were going around, just getting people to click on things because it's hitting the emotions, right? Imagine what's been going on with the election. Okay, this is the stuff we're seeing all the time. But if it elicits an emotional response, that's going on. But you want your people to be getting those from you without a malicious payload before they're getting it from them with a malicious payload. Okay, and if you do all this, this is 300,000 users across a year. We aggregated 300,000 users. Started off about 16% click rate, and that's on the easy ones. By the end of the year, down to 1.2%, that's a 93% reduction in clicking. By following those four simple things, baseline them, train them, and fish them. Um, and then measure the results to make the cover. So a year later, now normally with the training, it'll drop a little bit. If you don't continue that fishing thing, it's gonna go right back up. You're going to be right back in the same boat you started with. Okay? The phishing reminds them that this is out there. So, that being said, here's a bunch of resources for you guys. This is free stuff. Um, and I've got some uh, flyers and cards up here if you guys want some little things. Um, we have the phishing security test. We can check your people up to 100 folks just to see what how bad it really is. Uh, these are all free again. Hostage ma uh, rescue manual. I'm doing part two of a webinar next week on the hostage uh, rescue manual. Part one's online already. We have a ransomware simulator, which is kind of cool. It checks 10 different ways that typical ransomware encrypts files, 10 different methods of doing it, to see if your endpoint protection is tuned well and picks up on those things. That's a heuristic piece of it. Um, and then we even have free USB tests. So you can put files on USB drives in your own place and try to stop people and open them. It'll beat him back, tell you who it, you know, where these things happened, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Pretty cool stuff. That's a lot of fun. I feel very double O set of doing it. Um, so that's it. Thank you very much. I know we had a lot of stuff in here. Please, any questions? Yes. Yeah. Quick with uh, you talking about that, and I'm going to you a big 